Hi, I'm Dr. Bridget Mattis and I'm a clinical psychologist. I did my doctoral program at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and I did two years of postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology. Well, a traumatic brain injury occurs when the head is struck and the brain rattles around inside and, and gets damaged, or if the skull is penetrated, say by a bullet or a shard of glass, and that, that is the trauma that could damage your brain and create a traumatic brain injury. It could happen in a car accident, it could happen in a fall, you know, it could happen uh, in an infant that is sh shaken, um, as in shaken baby syndrome, that happens in very young infants that are being cared for by someone who becomes so frustrated that they pick up the baby who's crying and they shake it in an effort to get it to, to quieten down. And if you, if you shake the baby hard enough and long enough, the head, you know, babies can't support their heads very well. The head goes back and forth and the brain, which is sort of floating inside your, your skull, um, jostles around and hits either side of the skull. You know, maybe it's for front and back or side to side or both, um, causing bleeding and bruising of the, of the brain tissues and a, and a traumatic brain injury. And it can lead to death of the child. Well, the causes of traumatic brain injury sort of vary according to age. You know, if you're 75 and older, the most likely way you're going to get one is through a fall. You know, the elderly have very bad balance. You know, their vision is not particularly good. And, you know, they, they might stumble and fall at night going to the bathroom or even just walking outside their home on an uneven surface. If you're a little bit younger than that, say you're in your 40s and 50s, it's more likely that it's self-inflicted um, harm, like a suicide attempt, a gunshot wound to the head or, or something like that. Um, if you're younger than that, say in your 20s and 30s, it's probably going to be a car accident. And if you're a very, very young child, actually the research shows that it's most likely to be a homicide. In other words, the child was accidentally um, killed by uh, neglect, dropping the infant or something like that. Well, there definitely are different types of severity of a traumatic brain injury. And at the, at the sort of uh, lower end of the spectrum are the concussion syndromes where you know you have a slight knock to the head maybe you're playing sports or something like that and you maybe you get a little disoriented maybe you lose consciousness briefly um, and you have symptoms afterwards that may last for you know 15 minutes or for the rest of the day or a couple of days but you pretty much recover um, a more severe concussion would be when you actually do lose consciousness and um, the, the effects that you get from that can last for up to a year. You know, you might have memory problems, concentration problems, headaches, difficulties with your vision, irritability or mood changes. Um, but the definition of a concussion is that the symptoms actually will disappear, that you will recover and get better. This might be a good moment to mention that if you lose consciousness, it's a definite sign that your brain has been damaged. We don't lose consciousness without our brain having been damaged in some way. So that is a serious um, symptom, loss of consciousness, even if it only lasts for a few, a few seconds. So that's, concussion is at the other end. Of course, um, you know, a high speed motor accident where you're traveling at 120 miles an hour and your car hits a tree um, is going to cause you to perhaps hit the windscreen so that you actually um, damage your, the actual integrity of your skull, but can also cause an acceleration deceleration um, injury to the brain, meaning that you know, your brain is also traveling at 120 miles an hour. And then suddenly as you hit the tree, it stops traveling. It's suddenly going zero miles an hour. And that really causes a lot of stress and strain on the, on the brain and can cause what we call a diff diffuse axonal injury. It's where all the nerve cells in the brain have been suddenly sheared or stretched by this violent back and forth motion. Um, 
or side to side or both that happen in, in a high speed car accident. It's, it's interesting that, you know, you can have a, a blow to your head, say, um, you know, somebody hits you with something and it can crush your skull and cause a bit, you know, damage to your brain. And the, the wound looks terrible because it's bleeding and it's, your skull is cracked and, you know, you do lose consciousness. But you can actually recover from that better than you can from a high-speed car accident where your entire brain um, gets that acceleration, deceleration injury that leads to diffuse axonal injury. It, it, it can be a worse outcome from you, even though your head remains intact. 90% of individuals who suffer a severe um, uh, diff diffuse axonal injury are going to go into a coma and they won't wake up. So that coma could be for the rest of their lives. And that is one of the reasons why it's really important to wear your seatbelt um, and also not to, to speed or drive drunk because you really don't want to be one of the people who end up in a coma. Um, or if the damage is not quite so severe that you end up in a coma, you know, you might, maybe you're in a coma for a short period of time, or, you know, maybe you have bleeding or other damage. You, you might not die and you might not go into a coma, but you're going to be left with severe cognitive deficits, memory problems, um, you could be left with uh, problems in your vision and hearing. You could be left with problems in your personality and in your ability to regulate your own behavior. Um, the family members of people who have severe brain injury will, will say that they lost that person that day because the person is just not the same um, anymore. And that person is not going to come back. They're not going to uh, recover. And so family members will, will say it's like they're gone, but they're still there. And the grief just goes on and on because every day they see this individual who can't do the things that they used to do before, um, can't speak the same way, can't remember what's happening to them. And um, it's, it's very difficult for families. A traumatic brain injury doesn't just happen to the individual, it happens to the family member as well. It's almost like you'd have to grieve the person even though they're still alive. That's exactly, that's exactly right. You know, if a person dies instantly in a car accident, it's a terrible uh, traumatic event for a family, but, but the person is gone. Um, when a person has a severe traumatic brain injury, the person is still alive, but they're not the way they used to be. And the family constantly grieves the loss of who they were. They might not recognize their own family members. Um, they might not be able to work. Um, chances are they won't be able to work. Um, you know, they, they have difficulties in relationships. They um, can't, uh, maybe they don't see or hear as well. Um, you know, they can't, they can't make plans and goals and follow through. Um, they've, the, they've just um, changed who they are. It, the accident or the trauma has changed who they are permanently. Personality changes, um, you may not uh, notice it um, when you see the person. You know, when you talk to them, they might seem like they're kind of themselves. Um, but the individual might notice that their behavior has changed. One of the things that you often see with a personality change is the inability of the person to go back to work. And I'm thinking of one particular uh, client that I work with who, was, uh, who worked in the insurance and the car insurance business. And he was one of these people who would be able to go out and look at a car that's been in an accident and immediately decide how much it would cost for it to um, be repaired. And he was the, like the number one in his uh, car insurance company. And after his accident, he had a car accident and he was in a coma for a couple of weeks, but he recovered and physically he was very good. He could walk, he could talk, you know, and so on. But memory wasn't quite so good. But the biggest problem of all is that he just could not um, put things together in the same way. He just could not size up a situation. He just couldn't uh, put the pieces together and he lost his ability to, to judge, um, you know, what, uh, the car damage would um, would cost the insurance company, and as a result, he lost his value um, to the company. So you know, it's 
there's a lot of discussion in psychology about what personality is, but what a brain injury will do for you, it will affect your behavior. And if your behavior has changed, so too has your personality. If suddenly you can't work towards goals, if suddenly you have no initiative, if suddenly you don't look after your self-care, you know, those will make people say, well, what's wrong with them? Their personality has changed. They're, they're irritable now. They, you know, they don't seem to want to go anywhere or do anything. They don't, they're not working. What's, you know, what's wrong with them? These changes in personality come from damage to the frontal area or the frontal lobe of the brain. And unfortunately, this is the area of the brain that's most likely to be damaged um, in a car accident situation, for example. If your head hits the windshield, it's going to be there. If you get a, whip, a whiplash, even if you have your seatbelt on, the brain moves around in the head and it will hit the skull in the front and, the, and in the back and you will get damage to these frontal areas. What's, what's even more um, traumatic to the brain is that the inside of the skull is not smooth. The brain rests on a very irregular series of bones. And when the brain moves back and forth in an accident, it grates, it's like a, a grater, and it shears away brain tissue from the frontal area um, under the frontal area. And these particular brain areas are crucial in terms of your social skills, in terms of your ability to plan for the future, in terms of setting and reaching goals, in terms of predicting what the outcome of things might be. So people who have these injuries are engaged in risky behaviors, um, they're, they have poor relationships, they, they don't do well in you know, maintaining a business or, or a job situation. They can't predict when things are not going to work out and they pursue courses of action that are really are not um, good for them. And as I've mentioned before, these kinds of uh, injuries to the brain, they don't recover in the way a cut to your finger or, you know, or your leg or a broken limb might, might uh, recover. Injuries to the brain, uh, recover extremely slowly or just not at all. If the individual sustains a traumatic brain injury that's quite severe that results in you know changes to memory and the ability to work and uh, maybe causes headaches and vision changes, the person can become depressed and anxious because of those changes. But it's also possible that the injury has damaged parts of the brain that are responsible for the production of emotion. And the brain injury may exacerbate something that you, you know, maybe you had a little bit of obsessive compulsive issues, you know, you were very neat and meticulous and, you know, and so on. And after a brain injury, you might find that that has been exacerbated. I mean, Howard Hughes is a good example of this. After a plane crash where he did have an injury to his brain, his obsessive compulsive disorder got so severe that he would not leave um, the home at all. He started to, um, you know, to keep his own urine. He wouldn't even throw it out. He kept it in bottles in his home. So you, you can get mental um, health issues and concerns, both because of the reaction to the, to the injury and also because of damage to, to the brain itself. I have seen one or two cases where um, injury to the brain actually caused the person's mood to be elated. I, I worked with one young man who had an allergic reaction and his epiglottis, that little thing in the back of your throat, swole up and he wasn't able to breathe. So he got what we would call an anoxic brain injury. And after the injury, he was just so happy and thought it was just marvelous and he wanted to have more children. He thought he would get married. You know, he, he, he actually was so... Um, I would, could use the word high, so high after the, the, um, the injury um, that, you know, he, he thought, wow, you know, I survived this and, you know, life is good. The problem is, and I didn't work with him long enough to see how this would turn out, is that he probably was, would go home and, you know, find that he wasn't getting along particularly well with his girlfriend, that he wasn't able to go back to work, that he had memory problems. But I bring up this case because his mood was actually elevated rather than depressed as a result of the accident.
if I had to have one or the other, I think I'd rather have the elevated mood. But I imagine, I imagine that still causes problems. It can. It absolutely can. Because it might make you think that you can engage in, in a course of action, like starting a new business or in his case, he wanted to get ma to, to marry and have a child, might not be the right thing to do when you know you suddenly have all these medical issues, medical bills. Who knows what the future is going to going to hold for this young man? The recovery from a traumatic brain injury is, of course, depends on what caused the injury in the first place. And um, one of the things that you kind of uh, come to understand is that the most of the recovery from the brain injury. Um, occurs in the first one to three months after the injury. So you will get about 70%, 80% of the recovery that you're going to get fairly soon um, after the injury. Then for the next, up to the, to the first year after the injury, you will continue to see noticeable improvements. But unfortunately, after one year, there's little or no more improvement in terms of the recovery of the brain. The reason that it takes that long is that, you know, areas of the brain are damaged and other areas that haven't been damaged do try to take over the functions of the brain areas that have been damaged and making those connections in the brain, uh, having them, you know, work effectively takes time. And one of the things that helps that is the rehabilitation process. Depending on the severity of the injury, the person may have to learn how to walk again, how to talk again you know, how to um, speak again, um, and so on. And re will require a lot of help from occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, psychologists. Usually it's a multidisciplinary effort to help the person get back to the way they were before. There's really no cure. What you really are is trying to maximize the ability of the of the person to be as good as they can be considering how much intact brain tissue they still have um, left one of the the areas that we haven't touched on that that really is um, often uh, d damaged in a traumatic brain injury is memory and this is a this is a good example that i can use because what will happen is the person might be able to engage in a conversation and they may be able to pay attention and concentrate. But what happens is they're suffering from a memory uh, deficit. And so when that event is over or that occasion is over, they don't store that information or that memory and they, they have no memory of it. So they have difficulty creating new memories. And there's really not much you can do other than to train the person to write down information about their day, about their themselves. Sometimes if the damage is severe, the information has to be on a card, the person's name, where they live, you know, who to contact in an emergency and a reminder that they've had an injury, you know, because they, they have no uh, ability to store information. So they need an external device, a memory book that can provide them with the information they need to know about what are their tasks for this day? What doctor's appointments do they have? You know, who, who is their doctor? Because they don't remember, um, you know, any kind of pills they need to be taking. Practice, let's say they've been given homework by their speech pathologist to, to say these sentences and uh, try to pronounce them clearly. They would have to write down that they have this homework because they wouldn't remember it. And these memory deficits, while they do improve um, over time, they really are one of the most um, long-lasting and, and, and difficult deficits that someone with a traumatic brain injury could have. And it's very, very frustrating. And it really does impact your ability to, as I've said, have relationships, work, and, and just do your day-to-day -day tasks. If you've ever seen the Adam Sandler movie, 50 First Dates? Yes, I have. Is, is, that, is that a possible, like, I know that's probably dramatized for the movie, but is that a possible scenario in terms of what you're talking about? It definitely is a possible scenario where the person wakes up um, and because they have the inability to make new memories, they don't remember the previous day at all. And without some kind of written down information, um, they, they really can't function. And typically these individuals would be in an institution because they really can't manage their lives. 
in this particular situation, this individual um, was being uh, was living with family members who were willing to um, uh, to look after them. Um, so it's not unusual in the 51st dates, you know, Adam Sandler character, you know, went every day and, and, and told the Drew Barrymore character who he was, that they were in a relationship, you know, what happened and so on. And, and, and maybe in the course of that day, you know, the, um, the person begins to get the sense of it and the feel of it. But then the whole nighttime, you know, it's eight hours, 10 hours of, of no reminders. And so the process starts um, again. What was a little bit Hollywood for me was that, you know, with this rep repetition every day, um, at the end of 51st dates, she seemed to get it and, and finally remember it and, and have it permanently. I'm not sure how often that would actually happen um, in real life. I think that's the Hollywood twist um, situation. Because typically memory deficits, um, you know, especially if the first year has gone by, what you've got is what you've got. It's not going to get, it's not going to suddenly um, improve. The way that could have worked, let's say it was your first, you know, three or four weeks after your injury and you had an injury that really was recovering, then I can, then, then yeah, memory suddenly seems to come back um, after three, four, five, six weeks if you have a more minor injury. If you have a severe injury, it's just not gonna come back in the way that you would like it to. Well, there are a variety of things that we, that we need to do. The first is, of course, to wear your seatbelt. Now, I'm like, I was like every other teenager. I wanted to drive fast. I never drove, I, you know, I always drove as fast as I could to get wherever I wanted to go. I never wore a seatbelt. But after working in traumatic brain injury, I wear my seatbelt obsessively. I saw way too many people um, who, who didn't have on a seatbelt and who were ejected from vehicles, whereas the person sitting next to them had on a seatbelt and they didn't get an injury at all. Um, so definitely wear your seatbelt. Secondly, wear a helmet. And you know, you think about helmets about, well, you know, well, if I'm, you know, riding a motorcycle, I'll wear a helmet, but actually helmets should be worn if you're skateboarding, if you're skiing, if you're horseback riding, you know, if you are playing sports. Um, I wish that they could wear a uh, helmet in soccer, but unfortunately they can't because they, they, you know, they use their heads, they use headers to, you know, make goals happen. And we now know that, you know, just doing, hitting the, the soccer ball with your head repeatedly over time can result in, in um, trauma to the brain. You know, you get a little bit of trauma, a little bit of trauma, and it adds up um, over time. And so, you know, co concussions happen in soccer, but, you know, nobody, nobody is wearing a, wearing a helmet. We need to prevent falls in the elderly. That is a huge um, problem that leads to brain injury in the elderly and really it takes away from quality of life in what would be a, a, a vibrant, you know, 70 year old who, who falls and, and hits their head, you know, could have a really bad outcome. So we need to make sure that they, um, whatever medications they're on, that they are being followed and they're not, you know, accidentally taking too much medication and getting groggy. We need to make sure they do balance exercises. We need to make sure that their vision, you know, is good. And, and we try to make sure, we want to make sure that this, the, the floor that they're walking on is as even as possible and that they're not, you know, toys or things that they could um, trip over. Because one of the things that you lose when you get older are your balance reflexes. If you or I were to trip, we would put our hand out to stop a fall. But that quick response is gone in the elderly and they will plunge head first into the floor. And so that's why we really have to be careful about that. We also want to make sure that children's environments are safe, right? We, we hear about children falling out of windows, children who fall out of their crib, get injured as a result of roughhousing play from older siblings. You know, we really need to make sure that, that you know, young, young kids are, are safe in their environments don't drink and drive and don't speed because 
you know, the amount of injury that you're going to get from a high speed crash is a lot more than you'll get if you're going at, you know, 45 um, miles an hour. Um, so those are, those are some of the, the best ways to, uh, and of course, even though it's not a traumatic brain injury, you know, drinking and um, uh, drinking itself and taking drugs can also damage the brain. Um, and so I don't recommend that either. Hey you guys, thank you so much for watching. And I wanna give a huge thank you to Dr. Bridget Mattis uh, for being a part of this video. Uh, super fascinating information. It was great speaking to her. Um, she was one of my best professors at Cal State LA. So if you ever have a chance to take her, if you're ever going to school there and you see her in the courses, definitely sign up for her class. Also, before I forget, if this music that is blessing your ears right now is something you would like to hear more of or like to hear other songs like it. I will leave a link in the bottom for my sister's Instagram. She composed the music, uh, super talented, so go ahead and check that out. All right, this has been Man of Nothing. <laughs>